For a second, if you woke up one morning and people started telling you that everything you knew about revenue, everything you knew about finances, wasn't the way you thought it was. Well, I mean, that's almost inconceivable. Except to the people in this room, you've already got that. You've already been there, done that. I'm going to stand up and tell you that the exact same story works for health. Almost everything you've ever learned about health isn't the way it is. And there's good reason for it. I'm going to tell you a bit about the story so that you understand the pieces of the puzzle a little bit. But I want to start out by explaining one thing. The price. The price of health. The price of health is not negotiable. You can't bargain, you can't fudge, there's no time out, the meter always runs. Health is cumulative. Our experience of life, our experience of time is linear, and what happened to you when you were four, and when you were 14, and when you were 44, those experiences are cumulative into your future. Yes, you can heal, if you cut your finger, you can heal, that's lovely. But that healing took something from you. Something else had to give in order for the energy to go to your finger and heal. Your health experience is totally cumulative. And you either pay the price for health, or you pay the price for sickness. So when I talk to Payman, I say, hey Payman, go to health. He, he heard the end of that. Because if you're not going towards health, where are you going? You're going to do what everybody else does. You know, they talk about that definition of crazy, doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. And, and, and if we look at what everybody gets in the United States, if we do what they do, we get what they get. There's no question if we do, I mean, it's a principle in training, it's a principle in business, it's a principle in sports. If you do what everybody else does, you get what everybody else gets. And what do people get? On average, people get a life that finishes with 30 years. 30 years of suffering. Chronic, debilitating, eventually degenerative conditions that become pathogenic. Pathogenic meaning that it causes their death. 30 years of suffering, and then they go out in parts. Any volunteers, anybody want to go out in parts? What a lovely thought. Yeah, I'll lose my leg this year. Maybe I'll lose my ability to walk next year. Lose my enthusiasm somewhere along the way. Who wants to go out in parts? What a, that's a tough road to hoe. The price for health is not negotiable. You pay the price of health, or you're going to pay the price of disease. There is no way around it. But it's an interesting phenomenon because we are so deeply enmeshed our consciousness is so trained to think a certain way that very often it's almost impossible for us to step out of the box. You just, I mean, you know, you think of the things you've tried to tell people about finances and they just can't even see it. Have you ever had that? They can't even see it. Let alone imagine that it's real, that there's something could be done, that there's a solution to the problem. They don't even see the problem. Well, I got no problem, man. Doctor says I'm diabetic, and if I do what he says, I can be a diabetic for the rest of my life. <laughs> wow, that's great, Doc. You really helped me out there. Go to your doctor. Say, Doc, I feel good. I feel really good. I got energy. I've, I'm working out every day. I'm having a good time. I, I love my neighbors and family and friends, and, and I feel enthusiastic about everything. I never have an ache or a pain. Doc, help me feel better. I mean, Doc can't do anything to help you feel better. He's not trained in health. They're called allopaths for a reason. They're trained in all disease. 
That's what they do. And they treat disease in a very specific way. There's three ways that you can deal with your health issues. And only three ways that I know about. The first one is the one that everybody uses, the majority of people. They use what's called the medical model. Now the medical model is a very simple model. It's there to suppress symptoms. That's all it does, suppress symptoms. Your foot hurts, we give you drugs to suppress the symptoms. Stop, you don't feel the pain, pain's still there, you just don't feel it. I don't wanna feel pain. That's pretty much how people are about almost everything. They don't wanna feel it, they wanna be numb through most of life. Just kind of brain dead, wait for the body to catch up. And <laughs> body catches up pretty quick. The allopathic model, the medical model, says basically this. The conditions, substances, influences required for health in a state of health are completely different than the substances, influences, the forces, the conditions we would supply ourselves with in sickness in order to regain health. Oh, tell your kids to drink milk when they're well and build strong bones. But if they're sick, they shouldn't drink milk because it'll make them stuffy and congested. And I'm wondering, how does the milk know if you're sick or if you're well? <laughs> Don't take drugs. There's a war on drugs. But if you're sick, you need drugs to get well. well the drugs will make you sick if you're well, and well if you're sick. And then they're, they're smart, huh? They're, those things. Are... It's a model that we all laugh at and we all use. Well, there's better ways. And the second better way is so well named that it's almost scary. It's so well named, it's called the alternative medical model. It's still the medical model, but you don't take drugs if you got a headache anymore. Now you go see the acupuncturist, get needles in your arm. Because most likely the reason you have that headache is because of a shortage of needles in your arm. <laughs> oh, you know, and when you're depressed, no more drugs for me. I take Bach flower remedies and aromatherapy. I surround the room with purple light. Because I'm suffering from a shortage of purple light. And that's why I'm depressed. And I start thinking, the alternative medical model works like this. The goal of the alternative medical model is to suppress your symptoms. And the way they do it is with a philosophy that says, the conditions, substances, and influences that you subject yourself to in health are completely different than the ones that you would use to create health in times of sickness. Well, you don't get, you don't go to the chiropractor when your back feels great. Well, you know, the drug companies and the chiropractors and everybody else, they're getting smart. They're saying, well, you know, if you feel really great, come to the chiropractor, I'll keep you feeling great. You're going to eat that chili, you know you're going to hurt yourself, take these drugs in advance. Look, oh, man, they're, they're getting smart. Because they don't want you to see the, the sheer stupidity of the idea that the substance influences are going to create health in times of sickness, but in times of health, how are they going to create health? If that's for me, just tell them I'm busy, okay? Thank you. There's a the third model. The third model, oddly enough, is also well named. It's called the health model. And the health model is unheard of. But it's got a philosophy that goes like this. We're not trying to suppress disease. In fact, we don't even think of disease as a problem. <laughs> disease is your body's attempts to deal with the conditions, substances, and influences that you've subjected it to. You hold a rake in your hand for long enough, you're going to build up some calluses. That's your body's body's response. 
The health model basically says this. The substances, conditions, influences, forces you subject yourself to in times of health are the exact same ones you would use to get well as to stay well. No difference, except that we modify it to the needs of the individual at the time. So when you've got aches and pains and you're tired and no appetite and can't control your temperature, fever and cold and your hair hurts and everything's going wrong and mucus is coming out your eyes and ears and nose and, and you're just like eliminating at a, face, at a pace that's faster than usual, you're getting well faster than usual. You don't call that being sick, it's getting well faster than usual. You're detoxing at an accelerated pace. Nothing wrong with detox. I saw a bunch of people already today. They're trying to detox. They're trying to alkalize their body. What a concept. Think your body ain't taking care of that for you? Your blood pH changes by even one-tenth of one percent. There's a good chance you're going to die. Okay, you're not going to alkalize your body. body. Body's alkalinity isn't just swinging up and down. It stays 7.4. Goes down to 7.2, you died. <laughs> It's so much fun being healthy. I'm looking around going, huh, freedom rally. And I'm wondering, who here would like a million bucks? Anybody? Tax-free. Okay, yeah, tax-free, of course. <laughs> Anybody willing to give up their legs for a million bucks? No? <coughs> 10 million? Get tempting yet? <laughs> Give up your arms for 50 million? Oh, can't pick your nose without arms. I mean, it'd be tough, huh? You know, we start thinking the average American, none of us are average, right? We're all above. There was a study done recently where they interviewed about 100,000 drivers across the United States. And out of 100,000 drivers, over 90,000 of them, and if you're all familiar with the, the bell curve, 90,000 of them should have been in the middle. Over 90,000 of them said that they were above average drivers. <laughs> and we look and we go, okay, the average American misses 18 days of work per year due to sickness. Now, I, I know, because I've seen them, plenty of people go to work when they're sick. They're missing 18 days because they can't go. But they go to work sick a lot more times. Anybody fly here? Was your pilot sick? Yeah, you don't know, do you? He could have had a heart attack right there. Even if he's, I mean, a sniffle could be, a, could be bad at landing time. Be like, be like in L.A. when I flew into L.A. It was, is uh, pilot comes on and says, okay, we've hit the smog layer and come to a full stop 60 feet above the runway. The smog is now holding the plane off the ground. We're waiting to settle in. This is the softest landing I've ever had. We have an option. We supply the conditions required for health, or we do it the other way. So here's an option. How many people here with some serious money would be willing to just, we're pretty much amongst adults here it looks like, how many people here with some serious money go use this plan? This is your financial plan. Smile, that works better when you smile. Here's your financial plan. Piss it all away. And then by some miracle, somebody's going to get you more. Oh, that doesn't sound like much of a financial plan. How, but we're willing to do that with a health plan. I'm just going to destroy my heart every which way I can. I'm not going to exercise. I'm going to eat them fatty foods. People know what to do to make health happen. It's not like I really need to tell you. I'll tell you a little bit. But people really know. They're just not doing it. They know how to be healthy. They just don't know how to be happy about it. Ask a hundred people on the street, what do you need to do to get healthy? They'll tell you, need to lose weight, need to quit drinking, need to exercise more, need to eat more fruits and vegetables. 
stop smoking. People know what to do. It's pretty simple making health happen. I mean, it's, it's all pleasurable. If it wasn't pleasurable, you wouldn't do it. So we're, we're going down the road and we're going, mm -hmm, okay, what is it that's going to make me get healthy? Well, I figure if I just piss my health away and then I get in serious trouble, well, you know, they, they have them lung transplants now. So I can get lung transplant, and, and three out of ten people survive the operation, and so I got pretty good odds on my favor that I'll survive. Of course, I'll be on drugs for the rest of my life, and there's that war on drugs. I don't actually think there's any more war on drugs. I think the drugs officially won. <laughs> so, look in anybody's med. Who doesn't have one drug in their medicine cabinet? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fourteen people. Huh. You know, the average American consumes a hundred toxic chemicals before they finish breakfast. You got drugs in your house you don't even know about. There's drugs you don't even have to put on the label. They've got it all totally, totally locked in so they don't even have to tell you what the drugs are in the food. I'll tell you something, if your food comes with ingredients on the list, it's not food. Food don't come with ingredients. It's either an apple or it's not. <laughs> if it's got ingredients, you're kidding yourself, thinking that's what's going to make you healthy. The health model says basically this. <laughs> We're not here to suppress your symptoms. Not here at all to suppress your symptoms. Let's stop causing your symptoms. Let's eliminate the cause of the symptoms. Let's start causing health. Participate in the substances, conditions, influences, activities, forces that result in health. Health is the natural, you know, plants. We take better care of plants than we do ourselves. They come with that little list of ingredients, list of late instructions. You just stick it right in the plant. You know, give this plant X amount of sunlight. Don't give it too much water. It likes to be warm. You know, and you give it exactly, if you have African violet and you take perfect care of that African violet, don't you expect to end up with like perfect African violets? You're gonna win prizes if you take good enough care. The plant knows what to do. People are no different. Maybe we need to have a label stamped right on our head. Oh man, take good care of you. How much sleep do you need? Any idea? And a room full of intelligent people. How much sleep do you need? Five hours, six hours, seven hours? Eight hours. You know how much sleep you need? Enough. <laughs> You need enough until you want to roll out instead of roll over. There's no, no miracle in that. You need to get enough. What's the most nutritious food you could eat? Fruits and vegetables. We've all heard this a million times since we were little kids. When you eat anything, anything at all except for fruits and vegetables, you're not doing it for its health value. Don't kid yourself. If it came in a bottle, box, bag, or can, you're not doing it for its health value. It's not fruits and vegetables. That's the most nutritious food. End of story. Don't complicate it. We, we get this view of nutrition like more is better. And we know we get nutrients from sunlight. So let's go lay out in the sun from 7 in the morning till 7 at night on June 21st. See if we can, you know, by noon time you'd be in the hospital. More isn't better. What we're looking for is foods whose nutrient content closely mimics our nutrient needs. That's the most nutritious foods. Oh, well, you know, if I juice this stuff, it'll become way more nutritious. Anybody ever hear that? And I'm wondering, you remove the fiber from a fruit or a vegetable, that's called refining. So by consuming this refined food, it's going to be more nutritious than if we ate the whole food. Anybody ever hear the concept whole foods are good for you? So we're going to eat a refined food instead of a whole food, and we're going to tell ourselves, oh, that's more nutritious than the whole food because it came in a bottle. And what did we refine out? We re refined out the fiber. 
You know, fiber is classed as an essential nutrient, meaning you must get it only from your food. It's the only way you can get it. You gotta eat it. Can't manufacture fiber. And what do you get if you don't get enough fiber? You get constipated, exactly. And your hearing goes bad. What'd you say? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> So I'm thinking, okay, I'm removing an essential nutrient in order to make my food more nutritious. How exactly does that work? I mean, that's like the government telling you, you're going to be more prosperous by giving us taxes. Give us some of your money. You'll be more prosperous because of that. That doesn't work that way, folks. You can't give up nutrients in order to get more nutrients. Whole foods. We just love buying into the gimmicks. We're just, give me the next gimmick, give me the next, ooh, what's the next gimmick? It's amazing. Whole foods is a basic concept of healthy eating, and yet we're willing to remove the fiber, the protein. We're willing to remove everything from the olive except the oil. I mean, that's seriously refined. In fact, that's so refined that it classes as empty calories. It's calories without its nutrients. You eat empty calories, that's not real nutritious stuff. In fact, if you put empty calories on food, it's called junk food. I don't even want to see the show of hands. How many people are using oil out of a bottle? But food, food, healthy food doesn't come in bottles, boxes, and cans. Refined food instead of whole food and thinking, oh, that's more nutritious? Doesn't work that way. Whole foods, fresh foods. Ripe foods. Anybody ever hear that when you cook food, nutrients are destroyed? Yep. Damaged and deranged? Who heard that more than 10 years ago? Who heard it more than 20 years ago? 30? 40? I was 45 years ago. I heard that from my grandma. Oh yeah, we cut up these vegetables, throw them in a pot of water, you lose all the nutrients into the water, she said. She didn't just say, oh, you'd lose the nutrients. They're damaged, deranged, and destroyed. They didn't know that. They just lose them into the water. Make sure you drink. Who learned it more than 40 years ago? I saw a couple of hands still. Anybody knew 50 years ago that when you heat? 50, it's, would you say that this information that's been out for, at, I won't embarrass anybody by asking if it was more than that. This information has been out for at least 50 years. At that point, would anybody here still classify it as news? I don't think it's news, folks. So at this point, I've got to ask, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Somebody have to come right up to you and say, excuse me, you know, you're still eating that cooked food, and it's killing you, and what do you, you, you're doing this stuff for your health, but you're killing yourself at the same time? Does it exactly add up? You, you need a personalized invitation. <laughs> or maybe, maybe you want to think it more like that, that 14-year-old kid, you know, that 14-year-old boy that... He discovered his manhood, and he was in his bedroom just appreciating it. <laughs> and, you know, his mama still thought he was a little boy, so she had a pile of laundry. She just walked right into his room with folded up laundry and kind of was a, amazed to discover him. And she had a long talk with him. She said, Johnny, don't do that. Said, That's really bad. She said, you'll go blind. <laughs> and what did he say? Can I just do it until I need glasses? <laughs> Human beings have the amazing capability of pushing the envelope. And so the envelope that we choose to push is, let's see how badly we can abuse ourselves without dying on the spot. Maybe if I just abuse myself a little at a time, I won't notice that I didn't get to live 500 years or 1,000 years. I wouldn't even get 120. We don't get 120 years. Okay, so maybe you get 70. How many people going to get 80? How many people think 80 is a long life, honestly? Okay. So basically, you figure 80 is a long life. It's, a good, it's good enough, right? So every time I give you 80 cents, you'll give me a buck 20? I mean, I'm figuring if I can't get 120 years, if I don't live to 123, I don't get to see the next, the next, uh, next fireworks at the tricentennial. The fireworks at the bicentennial were amazing. I want to see the tricentennial. 
I'm in no rush to leave this planet, but I don't want to go through 30 years of suffering. In the last 25 years, I have not missed one day due to sickness. Well, maybe that's just a lot, but in my first 25 years, almost every single grade that I went through school, they weren't going to let me go on because I didn't attend enough days. My grades were fine, but I just didn't attend enough days. They weren't going to let me out of kindergarten because I didn't attend enough. <laughs> okay, that's, a, I, I, that's an A, I can tell. That's A and that's a 1. Okay, you should move on to grade No, you didn't attend enough days. I've been sick and I've been well. And well is a whole lot nicer than sick. Average American misses 18 days of work a year. In the last 25 years, haven't missed a day. Anybody know 25 times 18? Roughly? That's like two years of work. So who, who here wants to willingly give up two years worth of income? In the next 25 years, you want to give up two years of income? Is that why we're here today? I mean, we think about it and you go, yeah. Sick time is downtime. Does anybody enjoy being sick to the point where they would choose it over being well? No, but we think health is a crapshoot. That's what we're taught. It's just luck of the draw. You just open the window and by some happenstance, influenza. <laughs> it's, it's, health is caused. I created a 10 hour tape called The Cause of Health, just trying to explain people how they can learn to create health in their own life. And it's not about food. It's not about fitness. I'm amazed the number of people go, man, you're really fit. You must be really healthy. I go, there's fit people dropping dead of heart attacks left, right, and center. It's the number one killer of fit people is heart attacks. And the number two killer of fit people is cancer, just like everybody else. And they die, and they don't live any longer because of it. Oh, maybe a couple of weeks. But nothing, nothing outstanding. The fittest man on the planet was Jim Fix. Ate a steak dinner, dropped dead, a heart attack. Strongest man on the planet, the amazing Sandow. He used to wrap chains around his arm, and he'd bust chains with his arms. I mean, he was amazing. Artery, the aorta burst four inches wide. He got two more breaths, and he was dead. If you do what everybody else does, you get what everybody else gets. It's not all about food. I'm amazed that people can actually buy into the lie. We just buy, we, we just buy into the lie. We buy into the contradictions. We buy into the stuff that we... I mean, we're here knowing that there's all kinds of... I, I don't believe in conspiracy theory. Not one, how many conspiracy theory people are there here? Honest. Come on, you can tell. I won't, I won't turn you in. I don't believe in conspiracy theory. But I sure as heck believe in conspiracy. There's no question. There's a lot of conspiracy because how come you never heard of the health model? It's easy to understand why. The people involved in the medical model own everything. I had a good friend made a TV show all about the health model. The doctor saves lives every week. Poor Johnny can't talk. Poor Billy can't read. Poor Mary. She can't breathe through her nose anymore. Kids with hair falling out, all kinds of health problems, every health problem, heart disease, cancer, lupus, you name it, crippling arthritis, he made health shows. The guy, that, actually the same guy that did the TV show Hop Along Cassidy, I mean he had the clout to get shows on TV. And the week before the first issue was supposed to air, the drug manufacturers that advertise on his show said, went right to the studio, said, you air that show, we pull our advertising money. The show got canned. They own everything. They own the media, they own the schools, they own the pharmaceutical companies. They literally control the way you view the world. Meanwhile, the people who own the, the health perspective of things, they own nothing. The voice is like not even a little squeak at a stadium. Full of people. Squeak. We didn't hear that at a stadium full. Everybody's going the other way. They used to call me a health nut. 
back in the 70s, I was a health nut. You think it was a compliment? It wasn't. It was, if it was a compliment, well, then I could have returned the compliment, couldn't I? Somebody says to me, hey, man, you're a real health nut. I go, oh, thank you very much. And I can see you're a real sickness nut. It wasn't no compliment. They were baiting me. And how, do you, and how do you like your rabid food? They're just fine. How do you like your vulture food? I'm sitting in Kansas City at that, at that hotel where the stairway fell down. I felt really safe. I knew it wasn't going to happen again. And, uh, I'm being interviewed, and we're in a room in a restaurant. I mean, Kansas City, man, everybody, every single table, people are sitting around eating dead, burnt bodies, veins in their teeth. I mean, it was just like serious business, Kansas City. And the guy doing the newspaper interview, he says, I'm sitting there with a, a bowl full of strawberries. And he says, don't you feel just a little weird? Don't you think that's kind of radical? You know, no, I don't, I don't feel weird at all. I'm eating healthy food. I, mean, I, I don't feel bad for taking good care of myself. My self-image isn't so low. I'm not going to tuck my tail between my legs for saying that I want to take care of my own body. I said, I, I think what's radical is people eating dead, burnt bodies. They don't know when those parts die. I mean, beer comes with a label. This beer was born on June 21st. But you don't know when that cow died. You could have died last year. Would you eat a cow that's been dead a year? You, don't, you just don't even know. And nobody wants to know. It's basically a case of the entire story has been changed to protect the guilty. Because the guilty don't want you to know. You be a good little consumer. You just keep your brain totally numbed out. You know, there's more opium in grain products, grain, bread. There's more opium in grain products than there are in any other food. Opium makes it hard for you to breathe. Anybody here have problem, problem breathing besides the fact they live near Los Angeles? <laughs> opium, it numbs you. It's not comfort food. It doesn't comfort you, it numbs you. I wrote a little book on the problems with grains. You don't want to read it, because it'll change the way you eat. At least as an experiment. And I start wandering around, I go, well how many people really, really want to go to health? Maybe, maybe I'll just fool myself. Maybe the only people who want to get well is people on their deathbed. And all they want to do is get well enough so they can go back to causing their problem again. <laughs> Start working with pro athletes. Figure out they're some motivated people. You know you show a pro athlete how to jump 44 inches that can only jump 43? And it could be like $3 million a year extra in his pocket. You'd think he'd be motivated. Not too often. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree. Anybody here want to feel better? Anybody here really care whether or not their kids are healthy? I don't know what, anybody here would like to get down to their goal weight or have the energy to play with their grandkids? I don't know what your reasons are, but I'll tell you this, if you don't have some really good reasons, some really clear reasons for wanting to get healthy, you're not gonna do whatever it takes. You will have no motivation without reasons. There's people, all the knowledge in the world, 16-year-old kids, all the knowledge in the world. I mean, ask a 16-year-old kid anything. He knows more than you. It's amazing. By the time he's 26, he's coming to you for advice. But 16, he knows more than you about anything. And they're still starting smoking. How many 16-year-olds started smoking already today? Tons. Because they don't have any reason not to. Not that they can tell. They're, they're bulletproof at 16, as far as they can tell. How many people can tell they're not bulletproof anymore? <laughs> How many people in the room took better care of themselves at 30 than they did at 20? At 40 than they did at 30? 
Those are people who want to live. People are still living like you're 20. You'll live to be 100 years just like everybody else, but you're going to cram it into 50. <laughs> There's people dying in hospitals for lack of knowledge that a dietary change could get them out of the hospital. They could go, they could walk out instead of get carried out horizontal under a blanket. Without knowledge, there's no motivation. Without needs, there's no motivation. I don't know what your reasons are. You're gonna have to come up with your own list of reasons. I don't know, maybe it's purely cosmetic. I just want to live my best. I just want to be an influence on my kids or my mom. I don't know what your reasons are. I'd like to be able to get back to running again. I, I want to stop saying, I used to be able to. Oh no, isn't that just a friendly phrase? I know that without the education, without the knowledge, what I see people do to get healthy is a joke. They take perfectly good vegetables and dehydrate them. Now when you dehydrate them, you lose nutrients. Water is a nutrient, but you lose other nutrients too because the cells of the plant burst when you dehydrate, and so all sorts of things oxidize. They get exposed to oxygen, and the oxygen burns the nutrients. It's called rust when it happens to iron, but it's called oxidized when it happens to any other mineral. So you rust out your plants, and then you powder them up so they get good and oxidized. Then you put them in a bottle, somebody sells it to you, you bring it back home, you add water back to it, and you go, now this is more nutritious than fresh vegetables. Because I can eat more of it, but it tastes foul, but I can eat more of it. And I go, how can you eat more celery powder than you can celery fresh? And they go, well that's obvious, it's so little. I go, yeah, it's so little, but you've got to add the water back in. Otherwise, it dehydrates you. You know, down in Aruba, I had kind of an eye-opening experience down in Aruba. They don't, it doesn't rain in Aruba. Less than half an inch a year. 60,000 people living in Aruba. No rain, no water coming out of the ground. They got a desalinization plant. They take salt water out of the ocean and they desalinate it, take the salt out, and that's the water they use come to every house. Well, if a man in a lifeboat, he's out there on that raft, nothing to drink, nothing to eat, eventually he's going to drink the seawater. If he drinks seawater, what do you die of? Dehydration. But it's not from the water that you get dehydrated. It's from the salt. And then I'm looking at people going, well, if I start with seawater, and I dehydrate that seawater, take all the water out of it, so the only thing left is the salt. Now that's salt. That's really good salt. And I'm watching people in China, they take an ounce of salt to commit suicide. One ounce will kill a man. I'm thinking, okay, but I'm just having a teaspoonful, so it's good for me. Man, I read in a magazine last year that the, that the people who sold this particular salt, they called it living food. You know, since when was it living? There's got no DNA in salt. How can it be living? It doesn't reproduce itself. Oh, but it's really good salt. It's Celtic sea salt. <coughs> yeah, an ounce of that will kill you. We get to a point where you start looking at dehydrated food. Start wondering if that's any good for you at all. It dehydrates you to eat dehydrated food, doesn't it? In fact, anything makes you thirsty. Man's walking down the desert. Now he's crawling. Now he's slithering. What's he say? Water, water. I'd pay my taxes if you just give me water. <laughs> and he's going to die of dehydration. My question is, if I give him water, is he any less toxic than he was before I gave him water? If I add water, is he less toxic? No. How many people here are drinking water and saying, oh man, that'll detoxify me? It doesn't detoxify you. Your body, since you were, actually even before you were conceived, 
your body was self-controlling and self-directing and self-monitoring and self-repairing, self-governing in every way. And when you were two cells, there was a point where two cells got together, an egg and a sperm. It's a point in time that you probably don't want to think about what was going on at that time. You don't want to go there. Don't go there. But there was a time when that egg and sperm got together and you were, you were essentially a gooey blob. And two cells turn to four and four to eight and 16 and 32 and anybody good with math can go on and on. But that little, that little gooey blob was controlling itself. Within a couple of days, there's a brain stem and a neural cord and, and, and buds start coming off of it that turned into organs. And yeah, it's a miracle in many ways. Self-controlling. You cut yourself. Do you have to think about healing? We go, oh, this stuff is this stuff will detoxify me. It can't, it doesn't, it has no ability to do anything. Your body's doing everything. You're either getting in the way, causing sickness, causing disease, accumulating ill health dis-ease, or you're simply providing healthy conditions to the point where it becomes habitual to take good care of yourself. It takes no time. It takes no time to be healthy. It takes no effort to be healthy. It's not an inconvenience to be healthy. People go, yeah, but all, it costs all that money buying all that healthy fruits and vegetables and produce. And that's really expensive. And it's really, really expensive to be sick. That's what costs a lot of money. Price of health care is not going down. We take more tranquilizers in this country than the whole rest of the world combined. Would you say we're a tranquil nation? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the driving past pu public schools and it says no drug zone, drug free zone. Please, please honor our drug-free area. Now, wow, that's great. That's great. In Washington, D.C., out of 25 kids in the classroom, 21 of them are on drugs to slow them down so that the teacher can keep up with them. I'm thinking, this doesn't make sense. Put 21 kids on drugs so that the teacher can keep up with them? Why don't they just put the teacher on speed? <laughs> Be a whole lot less people using drugs, wouldn't it? <laughs> They're getting paid. <laughs> if I had to eat things that tasted bad in order for it to be good for me, I wouldn't do it. I don't know who would, but I wouldn't do it. Last time I checked, though, mango tastes pretty good. Watermelon tasted fine to me. I'll tell you what, when you're hungry, darn straight, anything. Lettuce tastes good. Plain. When you're hungry. Ew, plain lettuce? Yeah, when you're hungry. A lot of people don't understand the difference between hunger and appetite. Appetite is like this. Hey, you hungry? Yeah, I got an appetite. Well, I got some lettuce. Well, I don't really have an appetite for lettuce. You got me. Cheesecake? No, I don't have any cheesecake, but but I got some blueberries. Well, no, I was kind of hoping for a brownie. Appetite is ultra specific. Hunger don't care. When you're hungry, you'll eat anything. You'll eat the bark off trees. At least you try it. I'm not recommending that you eat the bark off trees. But you might want to, once in a while, decide, why are you eating? What am I eating for? Am I eating because if I don't eat, I'm going to start to feel? And there's a lot of reasons that I'm unhappy, and I don't want to feel them. I, mean, we, I look at why people eat. You know, people eat because we're happy, because we're sad, because we're lonely, because we're with people, because our team won, because our team lost. Because it's late, because it's early. 
Because it's time. Wow, it's time to eat. I'm wondering how does time know? You know, watch a little kid and you go, come on in, it's time for dinner. You go, but mom, I'm playing. Yeah, but it's time. So what? With a kid gonna drop dead if you don't eat for half an hour? That don't happen. We buy into such big lies that it's just unbelievable. Did you know that every piece of fruit has skin? Yeah, you know that. It's got skin. Hmm. And that a lot of fruits have hair and peach fuzz. And if you cut the two halves off of a mango, they're called cheeks. How come we, we put all these animal parts onto our plants? Because people eating animals don't want to feel left out. Take a little pick and start pulling the meat out of a nut. Take a spoon dig into the flesh of a melon. Oh man, that's, that sounds pretty carnivorous, doesn't it? Flesh and meat and skin and cheeks and hair. Got a hair, peach hair, peach hair in my teeth. It makes it, yeah, but, but we don't eat any cow lips. No, don't want to know about them cow lips. In fact, when you're eating them, you definitely don't want to know about it. And it's all just twisted around, isn't it? It's so twisted around because has anybody, I would imagine everybody here has driven up on Highway 5 and driven past those stockyards and smelled that smell? After you smell that smell, one time in your life, how can you ever, ever, ever eat another piece of meat? I can't even begin to understand how you could smell that smell and then eat meat. And I did it for 25 years, and I loved it. But it didn't love me back. I had diseases. I had symptoms. I had aches and pains. I had boils all over my skin. I had arthritis. I had all kinds of health problems. A chiropractor looked at my spine and said I looked 90. I stopped eating meat. Looked at my spine two years later and he goes, wow, your spine looks like a normal 25-year-old man now. I go, hmm, how's this possible? Only thing that changed, I changed my diet. And diet ain't the whole thing, man. You could eat perfectly and never sleep. You're going to be in trouble. You could be really well rested and never exercise. It won't work. Your health is as good as the weakest link. The absolute weakest link. You get the most return on investment. Excuse me, the biggest bang for your buck. Working on the weak links. I don't know what your weak link is. I don't know. But judging from most people, a weak link tends to be diet. People are kind of off on the diet thing. Standard Americans eating four times the amount of fat that's recommended for health. Not only do we eat four times the amount of fat, but then we end up eating half the carbs that we're supposed to. And now the new craze is eat even less carbs. It's really good for business. It's good for the medical model business. Let's create more patients. Just be a nice, dumbed down, opiated patient. Wait in line, go to the doctor, get your drugs. Don't be free thinking individual. Don't be free to pursue your interests. Heck, let's just dumb it down to the point where you don't have any interests. I mean, I'm amazed. I'm amazed that people are willing to accept that, that bright kids, oh, he's so bright, he's so awake, he's so aware. And then we just dumb ourselves down with food. My recommendation is do an experiment. I'm doing an experiment. I'm doing a raw food experiment, personally. I haven't eaten any cooked food in 25 years. I'll tell you how it's going to come out in about another 50 years. Come see me. I had a lady, she was 67 years old. She comes to me, and next, she's my next door neighbor, in fact. She said, I've been watching you. She says, you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. I go, yeah, Nancy, I do. Nancy's a nurse. She's overweight. She's got arthritis. She can't see or hear very well. 
husband just died a heart attack. She goes, I've been watching you. You're always working in the yard, running places, jumping on your bicycle, swimming out the canal, doing stuff, coming over here and painting my house for me. Thank you very much. Because I don't have the energy. She says, I'm going to watch you. She says, if you're still healthy in another 20, 30 years, I'm going to do what you're doing. <laughs> Folks, you just don't have that kind of time. Unless you're planning to live forever. Which isn't a bad plan. But unless you're planning to live forever, all I can ask you is, what are you waiting for? We're already shackled. If, if I could just snap my fingers, just go, that fast the change would happen. Is there anybody here who wouldn't make a change in their health? If you just put it on a piece of paper, show it to me, I snap my fingers, it's done. Is there one single person who would say, no, I would take my health exactly as it is right now. I want no improvement. Because if that's it, then you don't need to be here. But otherwise, if you're looking for anything to improve, if you keep doing what you're doing, expecting different results, it just isn't going to happen. People are going to start making fun of you. So well, that's the crazy person. Keep doing the same person, same things over and over. I got no miracles. I got no gimmicks. I got nothing to tell you that you probably don't already know. I can just give it a new angle. I can add some science to it. I consult with people who want to do their best. I don't really care if you're a world-class athlete or the most famous model in the country or doesn't matter. I mean, I work with them too. I won't turn them away. But anybody who wants to do their best, the people who, are, the people who want it as bad as I want it for them, because I get frustrated working with people where I want it for them more than they want it for themselves, I just turn those people away. No, I'll, I'll, let me tell you who else you can work with. They'll work with you. They'll be just fine. I want to work with people who want the best for themselves. And I know there's only one guy on the whole planet that can start from where he is and jump to the top of the Empire State Building in a single bound. And I've never met him. But all of us can get to the top of the health pyramid just by walking up the stairs one step at a time. I'll take you there, I'll hold your hand, I'll teach you how to do it. I run private seminars and sessions all over the world teaching people how to accumulate health. And I get these phone calls a couple times a week, people call me up and they go, hey, well, I'm just trying to sell you some health insurance. And I go, I don't use health insurance, man. I've got health assurance. What do I need health insurance? I mean, if I buy that health insurance, it's gonna ensure that I stay healthy? Well, no, it won't do that. <laughs> no, it won't do that. You mean if I join the gym, I'll get fit? No. You actually have to do the work. You have to go to the gym and exercise a bit. You gotta go play. If you wanna know, I got no gimmicks. I got no consumable products. Nothing repeat. I sell no food. You can get it in a grocery store. But I'll tell you, if it's got ingredients, you're kidding yourself. Still, step by step, increase the percentage of. Am I driving you guys just hellish me moving around like that? I'm sorry, but that's how I do it. Increase the percentage of. This is the catchphrase you want to walk around with. You're going to get what you can get this weekend, but you're not going to get it all, even everything that comes off the stage. You're not going to get it all. I mean, I heard speakers repeating things already because some people weren't getting it the first time. Bless them, that was a great talk. But increase the percentage of. The good stuff. What's the good stuff? Whole foods. You want to look at your plate next March and say, you know, I'm eating more whole foods than I was a year ago. I'm definitely heading in the right direction. Because it's about direction, not speed, isn't it? You go 60 miles an hour in the wrong direction, you go 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction, it's just not going to get there. 
I tried that, coming here. I don't know, I can't, it's difficult to tell if I'm going the right direction. I only, I only missed the turn off once. Increase the percentage of health of whole foods. Increase the percentage of ripe foods. You don't really have to eat green bananas. You can wait till they ripen up. They become more nutritious when they're ripe. You buy persimmon at Thanksgiving, they'll be ripe by Christmas. You gotta wait long, that's all. They'll come. Whole foods, fresh foods, ripe foods, raw foods. Ain't hey, you no know, raw foods are good for you. I'm not standing up here saying never eat cooked food again. I'd be, I'd be barking up the wrong tree, I know that. But the average American only takes 50 bites of food a day. If you eat one more bite of raw food, you've already increased your percentage by two. I mean, if you increase 2% a week, you be careful, because a year from now, you'll be eating a whole lot of raw food, 2% a week. Anybody threatened by 2% a week, one more bite? That's like one more grape, one more strawberry. One bite of celery, extra, extra fork full of lettuce, whole fresh ripe raw organic. Folks, if you're thinking that organic don't matter, try a meal of pesticide. <laughs> Man, as, you know, you've heard everything in the world of nutrition. That's why it's so challenging. You've literally heard everything. But have you ever heard? That fungicides will make your kid's ADD go away? Or that if you just put some rodenticide and pesticide and make a nice little mixture of them together, that your sex life will improve? Have you ever heard that anything that ends in CIDE is good for you? Suicide, genocide, infanticide? Rodenticide, it's all the same. Fries on the side, it don't matter. <laughs> Next time you go in and order 911 on a bun, you might just want to think. Because it's killing you. There's other reasons. There are ecological and environmental and ethical issues. No time to even begin. But if you want to know, they exist. There's good reason that every single creature that's built like us eats a diet of fruits and vegetables. Whole, fresh, ripe, raw, organic plants. Increase the percentage of, go step by step. You'd be amazed how much progress. Most people overestimate how much they can do in an hour. But they underestimate how much progress they can make in a year. You'd be amazed what you could do in a year. It's about direction, not speed. It's about accumulating enough knowledge. That's all I got on my table. Lori's over there just like, how could you not go talk to Lori? I mean, come on, look at that smile. <laughs> But all we have is information, no gimmicks, some products to make it easier for you to succeed in your kitchen, but man, we're here to serve you. If you want to know, great. If you don't want to know, great. Enjoy your death food. <laughs> you know? I'm not a health nut anymore, by the way. Nobody calls me a health nut anymore and gets away with it. I tell them, I'm not a health nut. I am a health connoisseur. <laughs> Folks, have fun. Have fun getting healthy. Have fun getting wealthy. But I'll tell you, it is just not worth accumulating health for the first half of your life, pissing it all away, trying to regain it later on. Accumulating wealth, I'm all in favor of accumulating wealth, but most people spend the first half of their life gaining wealth and the second half of their life spending it trying to regain their health. I mean, it's just not going to, not the plan. Accumulate health. Build your health. Guide your health. Be like, oh, that's radical. And then, no, man, that's ultra conservative. I'm conserving my health. Somebody saw me out running yesterday. They said, what are you running for? I go, I'm training. Training for what? Life. I'd like to be able to run when I'm Figure I better start running now. If you want to be a healthy person when you're 80, you better start practicing now. I could easily go until it got dark outside. But we're going to keep on schedule before payment gets here. <laughs> I, I'm immensely honored to be able to come. 
I'm immensely honored that Payman had me come up here and speak with you. I look forward to getting to meet you and talking with you and answering your questions in any way I can. If anybody wants to get serious about their health, I'm happy to help you do it. Uh, if you know somebody that wants to get serious about their health, I'm happy to help them do it. If you want to ever get in contact with me, come on over to the table and I'll tell you how to do it. You can just always reach me by email. And I look forward to seeing each of you a little healthier and a little happier and a little wealthier every time I see you. And some of you, and you know who you are, if you got weight to lose, I look forward to seeing less of you. <laughs> Thank you very much.